questions that are uh, indirectly responsible for what I'm going to talk about today and just to see people was wonderful. Thank you. So uh, this lecture is uh, on symmetries of a space called a polyhedral product. Polyhedral products came to life, at least for me, through Sam and other people here in the audience, like Santiago. It was, again, a wonderful experience. Okay, let's see if I can get it to work. Left and right. Okay. Good. Thank you. So um, the ingredients for polyhedral products are just a pair of spaces, x comma a, where a is a subspace of x, and then the second ingredient is that um, k is an abstract simplicial complex. Um, the main subject of this lecture is properties of a space called ZK. Um, is there a, a pointer or a, a stick? Maybe I could try this. So this space uh, ZK is a, an object that uh, came to life in talking with Sam, Tony Barry, Martin Bendersky, and myself. So one of the things I'm going to talk about are these spaces, but in a very naive setting today. Oh, fantastic. Let's see if I can uh, operate it. Hi, Jacob. I need a quick lesson here. Which button is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, got it. Thank you. It's been five years since I've given a public lecture. This is the first time I've uh, been doing this in quite a while, and somehow it's a little intimidating, <laughs> but fun. Um, so, um, the uh, problems that we're going to talk about today involve just naive symmetries and uh, how they connect with each other. Um, some of this represents work of the, in the thesis of uh, Ali Al-Waisi in 2014. Um, so, as we started with before, the pair XA is a pair of simplicial complexes. We're going to take that as an ingredient in a recipe to make a subspace of a product space, in particular, we're going to let K be an abstract simplicial complex and um, um, the vertices of K will be denoted 1 through M. And now um, a K consists of a subset, a collection of subsets of the set 1 through M, which satisfies the standard hereditary property. So um, now, um, 
the polyhedral product functor and a moment angle complex turn out to be exactly the same thing. Santiago, Lopez de Medrano study these kinds of uh, spaces in the 1980s where they were known, I, I think they were known as moment angle complexes in those days. No? What are you, oh, okay. So that's not right. Um, uh, that's, well, yes, for sure, for sure. So uh, the definition of ZK is a union of products, namely let D sigma be a product of spaces Y sub I, where YI is either X if I is in the face sigma, or YI is equal to A if I is not in sigma. So this gives you a collection of spaces. Again, it's a naive collection of spaces that you might wonder why, uh, how and why they're interesting. Um, so Santiago, for example, started studying these spaces to understand the intersection of two quadrics, which when I was a student, I thought, well, you could just do this. And I learned that this is a very subtle and interesting subject after that. Um, so this lecture is going to be uh, addressing the spaces ZK of XA, where X is usually the unit interval, and A consists of the endpoints of the unit interval, namely S0. Now, last night when I was talking with Santiago, I was tempted to call these the uh, sliced tongue theorem. And um, uh, the reason for that is I met Santiago for lunch one day where he had a sliced tongue sandwich and he was explaining to me why the cases of x equal the unit interval and A equal to S naught is so important. I didn't understand it then, but I'm slowly understanding it in a better way. Um, so uh, here's an example. So suppose K is a simplicial complex with two vertices and no edges. So it's just two points. You could ask what ZK of D1 and S0 is. So as is written down, this is D1 crossed S0 union S0 cross D1, which is the boundary of the interval cross the interval or a circle. And so you think, well, if you're a first year graduate student in mathematics, you probably know this inside and out. You could ask, why is it possibly interesting? Um, well, um, a similar construction works where the pair XA is the end disk modulo its boundary. And in that case, the space, this polyhedral product, is the 2n minus 1 sphere. Um, so what we're going to do in this lecture is construct a few more naive examples to try to see if they have something interesting attached to them. Well, the uh, first case we're going to look at is where, again, XA is D1 and S0. That's part of the sliced tongue theorem. Um, and KN was the simplicial complex, which is the boundary of an n-gon. So it just has uh, n vertices and n edges. So uh, uh, let me see if I can. Here you are. 
Maybe. Uh, or I can pray for you. Or you can pray. Bernardo, thank you. No, just pay me. So there are various cases of end guns. There's a four gun, a five gun, and a six gun. So what we're going to do is look at those simplicial complexes, just the boundary of the end gun, and um, a theorem that dates back to Coxeter in 1938 is that. Um, is that that the space ZKN is a Riemann surface of genus G, where the genus is 1 plus n minus 4 times 2 to the n minus 3. Um, now, um, most of what I'm going to talk about is going to be related to this Riemann surface. Um, the case of D1 and S0 has similar properties, but again, I don't want to say what they are in public because I'm not altogether sure of that they're correct. Um, D2 S1 is both similar to D1 S0, but in some ways very subtle, at least for my eyes. So, um, Here are a couple of examples. So the first example is S1 cross S1, which we all know is the surface of genus 1. And if we use the 5-gon, ZK of the 5-gon uh, gives a surface of genus 5. I should throw in another remark. When I was preparing these slides, I have to say I had trouble making slides of surfaces. I hadn't made a file like this for five years. So you guys are being tortured <laughs> into a difficult situation for which I apologize. But I'm just going to use symbols for surfaces rather than pictures. ZK6 is a surface of genus 17. Now, the next thing I want to look at is what are the automorphisms of ZK of X comma A? So if you, clearly, if you have an automorphism of the simplicial complex, this gives you an automorphism of the polyhedral product. Um, there's another point I'd like to remark that's not on the slides. It turns out those are all the natural automorphisms. So if you're actually looking at this from a categorical point of view, the automorphisms of K are essentially the universal automorphisms of the polyhedral product. So my student Ali Al-Raizi had a project, and that is to try to understand a little bit of how the automorphisms act on the polyhedral product. Um, so, um, let's consider the cyclic group of order n, C sub n. So that would act on So there are one, two, three, four, five, six vertices. Z6 acts by just rotation. So it acts in a very elementary way. So now what I want to investigate a little bit is what do you get from that very naive action? And it turns out that this was studied um, even before Coxeter. Um, it was um, studied by a person who did mathematics, but was a colonel in the French Foreign Legion. 
And what he was interested in was trying to study necklaces. So let me say what a necklace is. You might start off with the end gone, and now you might have two kinds of beads. You might have a black bead and a white bead, and so you might have a white bead, a black bead, another white bead. Does that make sense? So you have beads with two colors. Um, my wife was here, she wouldn't be happy about this. I asked if I could borrow some beads for this lecture, but <laughs> I'm not going to say what the answer is. <laughs> um, so what Moreau was looking at were these engons with two colored beads and asking uh, how many are there up to equivalence or equivalence is rotation. How many distinct equivalence classes are there? How many primitive necklaces there are? Where a primitive necklace is one where if you rotate it, if you look at the rotations, you get all distinct necklaces. So he was counting those. And it turns out what he was really doing was looking at what Santiago was suggesting. He, after the fact, was looking at the polyhedral product for the endon. So these go back a long time, and uh, there will be an example shortly where you'll see they go back even further. Um, so the next thing I wanted, or I asked Ali to look at was, um, you have these rotations, so for example, the cyclic group of order four acts on the foregon. And so it acts on the polyhedral product. So you can ask, what is the orbit space? I think Santiago already knew some of this before Ali started playing with this, but um, I can't say for sure. You'll have to tell me afterwards. Um, so, um, the orbit spaces are kind of interesting. Uh, in the um, genus 2 case, what you get is a torus modulo in action of Z4, and it turns out it's not hard to check that that quotient is the 2-sphere. and. Um, the uh, quotient of the genus 5 surface by Z5 is a torus. And, um, well, the case of n equal to 4 actually, in a way, goes back to Felix Klein. So Klein was the first one, as far as I know, to observe that the uh, third braid group maps on to SL2Z, and it turns out that um, these naive projection maps from the polyhedral product... No, it's these missions. No, it's Did I? The machine turned itself off. It's turned itself off? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that means, but I may be in big trouble. <laughs> Pictures and no letters. <laughs> Everything has a solution. So, since it's oh, off, and these are ramified covers. These are ramified covers. They're a special class. We'll see why in just a moment. So these connect with some work that you did with Miguel and Ernesto. I'll say how. 
Wait, later uh, in the lecture. So, but from, 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 from the constructions, where are the fixed points? So I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a way to calculate the number of fixed points, but there's something you need to know. I don't know the answer in a closed form. They're given in terms of values of something called the Mobius inversion function and the Euler phi function. But, but, but the, the action of the cyclic group is free. No. But, but in the, in the, so, in the, so in the, look at what happens the, with, the oops, let me get a... Uh, but in the enagon is free. Oh, can I borrow the eraser? Oh, oh. So you don't have to put it in your pants. How about that one? So, you, uh, so it turns out that the any subgroup of Z mod N Z is the isotropy for some orbit. But if I take a prime, if you take what? A prime number. If you take a prime, they're simpler, but still not so simple. So it turns out there are two fixed points, and the rest is free. But oh. since there are actually this happen, no, for this is a machine. Okay. I think I'm going to press this just to keep the computer awake. But what I, what I don't understand is the action of the group is free on this collision. It's, a, it's free on the simplicial. So how come is? Let's do it on paper. Oh, okay. Okay. Meanwhile, then. Uh, Try and do it for S1 cross S1. You'll see that you get this uh, essentially a, a two-fold branch cover of uh, uh, S2. So it's like the hyper. Uh, so it's the 90 degrees. You're right. You take a surface oops, and give it a half twist. Uh -huh. When you do that, it's like a, barbecuing a sausage. So you get, and so what you get is. 2G plus 2 Weierstrass points. Uh -huh. Let's do it on paper. No, okay. but the computer is back. Okay. So, um, maybe let's push on to the next slide. And the second question is, this periods mean that if I put any N, the answer is minus N? Right. Oh, okay. Right. Wow. Wow. What a beautiful way to start. So. N minus four. Clear? Yeah, yeah. Just say more. You clear, yeah. which is closer to what you no, no. you did with these other guys. So um, you could consider that branched cover. In other words, just look at the orbit space. And it turns out that um, um, this quotient space is again a Riemann surface. And you can ask, what is its genus? We worked out a couple of them, and it was relatively easy to work out a few of them. At the end, I'm going to give a formula. No? You're not happy? <laughs> OK. <laughs> At the end, I'm going to give a formula. I don't know a closed formula for the genus of the surface, but we're going to see certain interesting things come up with this that's related to Moreau's work on necklaces as well as other things. Um, so um, the the purpose of the next few slides is to describe some joint work with Sam, Tony Barry, and Martin Bendersky that fits in doing the calculations with these Riemann surfaces. So um, 
I can't remember when this was. It maybe was 10, 15 years ago when Sam walked into the office and said, let's try to read about these things. And we did. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about some general properties of these polyhedral products in a slightly different context that makes uh, certain kinds of calculations fairly direct. Um, so the polyhedral products, these spaces ZKs, are nothing more than natural subspace of a product of X with itself n times, where m is the number of vertices in the simplicial complex k. Um, now there's a variation of these things. So I, there's some people in here I don't know. So I'm not sure whether you know what a smash product is. Let me say what it is, just to put this in context. So um, a product. Well, there's a, a two-fold product, x with its cross with itself twice. And now you can imagine looking at x crossed a base point union, a base point cross x inside of x. This is sometimes called the wedge product, x wedge x. And then uh, one of the main things we introduced was this, this naive construction where you take x cross x and collapse by x wedge x. And uh, so for an example, if you thought of um, s1 cross s1 modulo s1 wedge s1, this is the two-sphere. And one of the things that came out of this work with Sam, Martin, and Tony is that if you replace products by smash products, they tend to give you relatively easily accessible ways to understand these polyhedral products. Um, so, um, oh, I've already done this part. So we're going to think about something called a polyhedral smash product. Now some of you might think this is a crude thing to do, and you're right. But it turns out that it does give you accessible information. So um, we're going to look at the smash polyhedral product, which is the image of the polyhedral product in X smash with itself M times. And now, um, if X is the unit interval, then the smash product is a contractible space. So you might think it's perhaps not interesting. Well, let's see what happens. Um, so the first theorem that we used is a theorem that goes back to, to the 1950s by Peter Hilton. And what Peter Hilton proved was that if you start off with a product of spaces, x1 cross x2 up to xm, and you suspend it, then that's homotopy equivalent to a suspension of a certain collection of smash products of x. So what this tells you is that a product somehow, after you suspend it, breaks apart into accessible pieces. Now I need to put in some language in order to state a theorem. So um, the first thing on this page that I want to mention is what a full subcomplex of K consists of. So the full subcomplexes, that is K sub I, are just um, the vertices in I 
intersect with the face sigma, where sigma is a face of K. So this is a bookkeeping device. Did it make sense? Yeah. Everybody's happy with that. Okay. Now, this is what got Sam, Tony Martin, and myself started. We were uh, wondering whether these spaces ZK again could be studied more easily in some other context. And um, well the answer turned out to be yes. Uh, that um, ZK ZK of XA looks like a wedge of polyhedral smash products for so full subcomplexes of K. And now if you knew, if you know the full subcomplexes, you have a good handle on taking apart the polyhedral product. Um, uh, what, what are here the X sub I's? The A sub I's. Uh, so uh, let me back up t to answer that. So I is um, a sequence of integers between 1 and m, which correspond to the vertices. And so uh, you can think of x sm smashed with itself k times, where you take those k coordinates, the i first, i second. Maybe I should run an example. You're on. OK. Does that, uh, that answers your question? OK. So we have this decomposition. And again, you might ask, well, why is this useful? Well, um, we were able to work out the cohomology of many of these polyhedral products. Then we found out that Santiago had written a paper in the 1980s where he had already worked these out by hand. I still don't know how he could possibly do it. <laughs> but One example. <laughs> One good example. Um, anyway, Santiago was studying a related interesting problem with trying to understand the intersection of two quadrics. But I, that's not part of today's lecture. <laughs> um, so this theorem actually told us how to calculate cohomology and other sorts of things you might want to understand. Um, did I drop? No. Oh. Back again. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. So um, now um, we wanted to compute the action of um, the action of the automorphism group of K, we wanted to compute the action on this polyhedral product. And it turns out that, I just want to mention one point on the blackboard again that may not be familiar. If you're looking at, um, if you're looking at a map from the suspension of Y, to the suspension of Z. There's something called the left adjoint, which is a map from Y to the loops on the suspension of Z. And so, for example, maps of Y into this loop space are determined by maps of the suspension of Y into the suspension of Z. So they're basically understanding things in the same way. So what Ali was able to show is that um, this map, which is the adjoint of the stable decomposition, is equivariant with respect to the automorphism group of K on the polyhedral product. So this basically is a tool. It gives you a tool to compute actions. Um, 
And so uh, it turns out that if we wanted to know how something acted, and it turns out it's enough to know how it acts on the stable decomposition. Um, So this theorem of Ali's was first proven in his thesis in 2014. And then uh, two other groups of people have taken it up a little bit to understand the, just the representations that you get out. You end up getting some interesting representations of the automorphism group of K. Uh, 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 on this, and the auto, by the way, the automorphism group of K, in case K is just a graph, is any, any finite group at all. So you're studying fairly general groups in this setting. So for example, um, Fu and Gerbich uh, found applications to something called representation stability which is something outside of the world of polyhedral product, but is in the world of representation theory. It's an interesting construction. Um, and uh, these last three people computed some associated representations. The reason I mentioned this is the representations aren't always what you think they are. They can sometimes be quite complicated. I think that will come up toward the end of the lecture. Um, Here's an example. I was um, not sure whether to say what this is, but it turns out these maps, these stable de adjoints of stable decompositions, are given by something that's actually very elementary. What you do is you think of a free monoid on words in the polyhedral smash products. So for example, if we start off with a point in uh, the polyhedral smash product with three vertices, so something pretty simple, you might ask what this adjoint map does. And what it does is it just takes these words, x, y, and z, and adds them up. And then you think of formal products ordered in a dictionary ordering, add those up, and continue that way. So you end up uh, getting a natural formula which tells you how to split this thing. Well, now I want to get back to uh, necklaces. So the, um, as I mentioned, we were trying to compute homo the first homology group of this polyhedral product which is something you'd think you could give to a graduate student. It turns out it's not so easy. The first homology group is uh, non-trivial, and the value of the Mobius inversion function occurs in calculating numbers of orbits. Mu of d is the Mobius inversion function. Um, that, does anybody recognize this number? That's what? Which number? This, uh, let's see, this number right here, 1 over n times sum of mu d times k to the n over d. The number of necklaces with n it's, it's k different colors. It's what? Say that. The number of necklaces with n. It's, I, I mean, so I, let me offer an apology first. I don't hear very well. So you may be 100% right, but I may not be able to understand it. These are necklaces with two beads. Yes, this one is, should have been uh, for... Uh, this, this is an example of H1 for necklaces with two beads. And this number, this number came up much earlier. Um, it turns out that this complicated looking number involving the Mobius inversion function 
is calculating lead, numbers of lin linearly independent Lie tensors in a free Lie algebra. Is that what you were saying? No, I think I was slightly wrong. <laughs> in any case, it's come up in many combinatorial and um, uh, group theoretic ways. Um, so, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the same polyhedral products and again, more elementary constructions that you can do with them. So, uh, these polyhedral products and then maps from ZKN to ZKN minus one. So ZKN is a Riemann surface of some genus where you know the answer. ZKN minus one is smaller in a not so, so straightforward way. You collapse on one edge? Uh, no, you multiply. So the way to uh, do this is how are you going to multiply with these things? What is ZK of D1 and S0? It's a subspace of a product of D1s. Well, D1 has a multiplication. It seems a little crazy, but it turns out that if you use that multiplication, this is really something coming from the classical bar construction. So it turns out that you have these face operations that you know already inside and out. And um, well, once you make these, um, it turns out that there's a map of a circle into ZKN. So this map of a circle is, at least from my eyes, not a complete triviality. You have to kind of, the polyhedral product is weaving a circle in the Riemann surface in a natural way. And now you can ask, what is that? So, um, um, I want to describe a little bit more of the properties of this, and then I'm going to close with a homework problem. So, what could this map of S1 to a Riemann surface possibly be doing? So, um, it turns out there's another subject that some people in this room <laughs> had already worked on. It's um, Elaine Kahn, Jean-Louis Lode, and others, including Ernesto Bernardo and Miguel Chicotenkato worked on. Um, this construction of Elaine Kahn gave you something that builds models for free loop spaces and whose homology is measuring both Hochschild homology and cyclic homology. So it turns out that what this um, naive map of a circle, this naive map of a circle together with the action of the cyclic group that we saw just amounted to taking an n-gon and rotating it corresponds to a morphism of cyclic, that's where the Zn action comes in, semi-simplicial spaces. Now one thing I want to mention, these are not simplicial spaces, they're semi-simplicial, which means you can use the face operations, but not degeneracies. So um, uh, you get this map and you could ask, is it even interesting? Well, now I'm going to say a technical point that this map induces a map on the Hochschild homology of the tensor algebra, namely the homology of the free loop space. And you could ask what happens with this naive map into the polyhedral product. And it turns out that the... Um, uh, uh, free loop space has homology that splits into two pieces. One is an invariant part 
and another is a co-invariant part. And it turns out that this map is picking out exactly the co-invariant part, and it's sending the invariant part to zero. It's trying to split the homology of the free loop space. So I, don't, I have to say, I don't understand what was going on with this. And so my inclination for giving this lecture was to give a homework problem. It turns out that this polyhedral product, the way we described it, has a geometric realization. It's got to be an interesting space. All, all of its homology involves classic combinatorial integers. Um, does it somehow give rise to a natural space that you can understand in more natural language? Um, so uh, I've already mentioned this stuff. This is about uh, the image of Hochschild homology of the tensor algebra. So I guess the main point of this was this was a very naive construction that came up from a conversation with Sam when he just wandered into the office and asked the naive question. Um, there's one last remark I want to make. I'm not putting in any details. So a topologist of my stripe and many topologists in this room have studied the classifying space of a topological group. And it turns out these polyhedral products give yet a new filtration of a classifying space. So, uh, oh, thank you, Bernard. It turns out that um, if you look at the suspension of a loop space, there's an evaluation map. And that simple map, if you can understand it, usually has a lot of strong implications. It turns out the polyhedral product is filtering that map in a nice way, but I don't know what kind of consequences you get yet. But again, these are naive, but come up in a very interesting way. Um, I wanted to give a curious identity, and then I'm going to quit. Here are some numbers involving the Mobius inversion function. You could ask where this comes from. This is on my student Ali's thesis, and what he did was he compared the homology of two polyhedral products. It's giving you sort of these combinatorial number theoretic identities. We still don't know the meaning of those, but again, it, it's compelling. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be able to participate in this. Thank you. Questions? Comments? If you have any questions, could we do it on paper rather than by voice? I'll be able to read what you're asking. Or I'll repeat it to you. I will, I will repeat it to you. Okay, I'll try to understand. Loud. Just a comment. Uh, 38 Coxeter from the formula. First, first one you mentioned. About the liquid. The moment angle spaces of the polygons. And uh, then in the 80s, Hertz group found the same formula for an, certain intersections of quadrics that appear to him studying some algebraic uh, number theory and algebraic geometry. And it's the same formula. And it's only a lot later that it was, it was discovered that they were the same thing, that the intersections of quadrics are more than the Oh. What uh, Coxeter did was late, late, much later recognized as a precursor of the uh, moment angle.
So only at the end of the 90s it was covered that they were the same thing. So it's the same so thing. You so it was a comment that uh, what Coxeter did in the 38 was what? what one of these formulas that you have was discovered by Coxeter. Oh yes, so Coxeter actually was trying to answer a, surf a question about Riemann surfaces and so what he did was essentially construct a polyhedral product to do that. Um, no, no, he didn't do any calculations. He was essentially discovered the polyhedral product in some form. Uh, and then it appeared in 1938. There was no calculation there? No, there was no. It was a, basically a gym. I don't, let's see. <laughs> I, I better <laughs> but not go there. Una otra pregunta, comentario. Si no, muchísimas gracias, Fred, por la conversación.